All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Can you all hear me okay in the room? Excellent. Welcome, everyone. My name is Lara Vilama, she and hers. We are so thrilled to have you here tonight for our final session of lifelong learning lectures for the series. We'll be getting started again in the fall, but this is our final one for this particular go round. And we are thrilled to welcome Sabina, Dr. Sabina von Meering here today. Um, welcome to all of you who are here in the room with us and folks who are at home. For those of you who are here or at home who know somebody who was not able to be here tonight, tonight's program is being recorded and it will be on the library's YouTube page. So we encourage you to send anybody who wasn't able to make it to go check it out on the YouTube page after tonight. Um, we are thrilled to feature, as I said, Dr. Von Meering. She's a professor of German and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, the director of the Center for German and European Studies, program faculty of environmental studies, all at Brandeis University. And she's also a climate activist with 360 Framingham. 350, excuse me. Got minutes. 10, excited over 10 extra points. <laughs> Um, she'll be talking tonight, let's get future fit, envisioning Metro West beyond a climate emergency. Tonight's lecture is a part of the Lifelong Learning um, series, Lifelong Learning Lecture Series, which is a partnership between the library and Framingham State University. So thank you to our partners over at FSU. At this moment, we would ask those of you in the room to take this opportunity to please silence your cell phones. Any alarms, ringers, emails, texts, anything like that, go ahead and turn those off. Folks at home, you don't have to worry about that. So go ahead and take this moment to take an extra sip of your tea or coffee or whatever you've got in front of you that might be a little bit more fun to have on your couch. And tonight's lecture will be about 45 minutes and then we will have some time afterwards for questions in the room. If you're signed into your YouTube at home, you might have the opportunity to put questions in the chat, so you're welcome to do that if you like. Please do hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Um, and last but not least, we do have, for those of you in the room, some program evaluation forms in the back. We would love to hear from you what you thought about tonight's program. If you'd like to join our mailing list, we're the library, so the only thing we'll ever send you is more cool program information. And um, if you have any ideas for any future programs, a huge thank you to our sponsors, the Joseph L. and Ray L. Fund Foundation, courtesy of Elizabeth Fideller. And of course, thank you to the friends of the library without whom our programs would not be possible. If you would like to donate to the friends, there is a box in the back. With all of that said, please welcome Dr. Sabina Von Meering. Thank you, Lara. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming. I'm very touched. Um, and I, let's get started. So what I wanted to start with is a land acknowledgement um, because that is something we have begun to do. And I um, took the one from um, Framingham State University because I figured that made a lot of sense for this particular um, land. So <coughs> I would like to acknowledge that the land we live, work, li learn, and commune on is the original homeland of the Nipmuc tribal nations. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land on which we gather. Um, I also wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> bring you uh, back into 2019 because that was actually the last time I was here four years ago. Nobody thought in November 2019 what would be coming next. Um, at the time, my topic was the good news about climate change lessons from Germany. And as I was looking through what I said then, it was really interesting to me um, to see, you know, what has changed since then. And and that kind of informed um, my decision for what to focus on today. So um, at the time, I ended with uh, one of my favorite quotes from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, and I'm bringing that back at the beginning today because I was really struck as I was looking at Framingham especially since 2019, how 
how true this statement has been for this community. So first of all, just um, weeks, months, months, not weeks, um, just a few months before I spoke at that time, Framingham had hired its first sustainability coordinator. And, um, and that led a year later during the pandemic to a, um, the request to um, da, 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 to form a um, sustainability environment and sustainability committee, right? And um, that committee then took on, <laughs> I'm dealing with my weird glasses here, um, that committee took, um, met for the first time in July of 2021. And I know Larry, who's chair of the committee, right? Um, I know that all of this in these two years was done because you decided it needs to be done, right? And it's a small handful of people that said, we need to do something. And so it's really impressive um, because what has happened since, of course, is for example, that last June um, you uh, managed to convince everyone to declare a climate emergency. And that was you know, initiated by the committee. And now we have Energize Framingham also, which is doing uh, phenomenal work. Um, I see Aimee Povalka here. I, I stole this from a previous uh, learning, living learning um, talk, um, where you know the community is now engaging uh, more people, and you can see here the actions that have been completed and the carbon that has been saved, and this is of course growing over time and. Again, an interesting connection there is that Energize Framingham, of course, is a an offshoot, if you want, of Energize Wayland. Energize Wayland is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year, and it itself was also the the result of a handful of people just saying we need to do something. And the the handful of people um, that we all know is still doing their work and is doing yeoman's work. It's really amazing what they have been able to accomplish. Um, and they also <laughs> declared a climate emergency. Um, this was, again, you know, a handful of people that said, let's make this, take the step, inspired, of course, by the Extinction Rebellion uh, in the United Kingdom that started with these declarations. And in Wayland, it overwhelmingly passed at um, town meeting. In fact, 204 to 24 voted in favor of declaring a climate emergency. And it was, uh, because it was very uh, intelligently put together by the group of people, it actually not only made a declaration, but it also committed the town to taking actions to reduce emissions and um, creating a climate action mobilization plan and hiring a sustainability manager. And so June 22, Wayland issued a climate action mobilization plan. And um, that includes such important pieces as decarbonizing our homes and buildings, moving to clean energy, there's a tra transportation piece, adaptation and resilience, nature-based actions to mitigate carbon, food and waste, and resident engagement is a big part of it. All of this was cooked up by people who care, who got together and said, let's do something, let's tackle this, that, let's, let's get off the sofa. Um, and uh, currently, there's another parallel where, thanks to Energize Wayland, Energize Framingham, we have a, pr a push for people to uh, get mass save, to do audits of their homes so that uh, we can save energy and you know people get a really good deal on the kinds of initiatives that will um, decarbonize their homes. Um, and it, it, what I also found is that, yes, these are all really beautiful successes, and but you have to keep at it. So for example, we passed this emergency declaration, the town agreed to it, the board of select agreed to it, to the, the select board, I should say, and 
And then suddenly someone said, well, let's make this a part-time part position. And we were like, wait a minute, <laughs> right? And so people had to petition to make sure that, no, we need a full-time sustainability manager. And again, it was because people paid attention and they put the work together and they went out and got people to, to sign the petition. And sure enough, just on April 10th this year, Wayland welcomed its first sustainability manager, um, who is wonderful and who will make a lot of things happen that we could not make happen if it was just the five of <laughs> the five people, the handful of people that, that got things started. But if you look at this trajectory, you see how small actions become larger actions and then how, how this can grow, right? So I think for me, that's really the biggest and most powerful message is that we can make things happen. We just have to take the first step. And so just like in Wayland, you have the same initiative in Framingham. Framingham saves. Framingham saves energy. Um, and people are encouraged to sign up for no-cost energy assessments at their homes. There's also planning happening for energy resiliency. You know, because we all know, of course, that we will have to live with climate extremes. And so it's very important that we understand how we can best be protected and what we can do, um, especially to address um, vulnerabilities um, in our homes and in our communities. And, and I really liked how um, Aimee talked about, you know, the, the fact that we need to make the community resilient through a number of steps we can take, solar um, as, as a aggregation, um, but also things like composting, working as a community to keep our uh, towns and cities beautiful, and planting native, native um, plants so that um, we can keep bees and butterflies and all the other insects that help us grow food. And this is just, you know, one slide out of many of the things that we can do. Um, but resiliency also means social resilience, knowing your neighbors, getting to know each other, so that we can be there for each other when things get tough, and they will get tough in the years ahead. So it's really important, I think, that we've started to build these networks, that we've gotten to know each other, that we know where to go, and that we are not uh, doing this on our own. And sure enough, there, it, there is your climate action plan in the making. And I hope you are all aware of it and part of it and contributing to it because that is how, of course, um, this becomes big. Um, and, you know, I know <laughs> Debbie is here. I know Nedic has done a lot as well. And uh, I just f found this one slide helpful because, of course, especially at the beginning, there is a lot of money on the table. There are grants that we can get. There, is, there are savings that we can um, benefit from. And of course, there also needs to be a lot of investment. But if we make the investments now, that will save us a lot um, in terms of the damages later on. So the conclusion for me is people power works. And it's so important because there is so much talk about climate grief and climate anxiety and the people are so in despair about the climate crisis. And when you look at just these last four years and the enormous progress that has been made in these two communities, or three if we include Natick, that there is so much that people power can do and it just requires a handful of people. But they have to be committed and they have to stick with it. They have to sort of hold on to it and keep working. They can't just sign a petition and disappear. Um, so what I'm hoping is that you all, that you are here, <laughs> are inspired to join uh, 350 Mass Metro West, which is our climate movement here in, um, in the Metro West area. Come on in. You can grab a cookie too. <laughs> um, but no coffee for you. Um, and, um, and we are, of course, part of the statewide uh, network uh, 350 Mass. Um, and so, you know, this is one of the many groups that are active in, in this fight. And I think um, 
as you can see in the picture, <laughs> much easier too, as you can see in the picture, it's also really important to have fun. And we really are good at having fun in 350 Mass. We're not just talking about um, how to save the planet. But we must save the planet and uh, the people especially. And so I think it's important to also remind ourselves that we are on a timeline. Um, the MIT climate clock, I copied this last night, so it's not moving, but if you go to the website, you can see it moving. And the, the clock is set for the time at which um, we anticipate surpassing the 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is 2.5, uh, 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit of warming that will, is considered the limit that we should not pass. Um, and so there is urgency to our actions and there's urgency to, to uh, the decarbonization efforts. And so in the, in the announcement to this talk, I, I, uh, when I wrote it, I was on sabbatical and I thought, I have the time in the world and I'm going to talk about everything. But <laughs> I realized that doesn't make sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus in on one issue. Um, and as you can see here, this is two years old, but it's still very similar. The biggest carbon footprint in the United States is transportation, and that is true for Massachusetts as well. And so I'm going to think with you a little bit about what we can do uh, to address the, to reduce carbon uh, footprint uh, transportation. And like last time, you know, I come from a place where that is very easy because I grew up on this little island in the North Sea called Langeoog, which is the, the third one here from the right, that one, kind of pistol shaped. Um, and the island in northern Germany is in, in uh, special because, and it looks very nice, although it's very cold, and they, their slogan is no sharks, no cars. Um, because they have no cars. Um, and, and so growing up without cars, um, f you know, living on an island without cars makes you just understand that that is entirely possible. Now, obviously, it's very easy to live without cars in a tiny place, but I think um, it helps visioning, it helps envisioning this, um, this future without cars or with... Uh, Definitely not gas powered cars. Um, the other thing is, of course, that you've probably heard of the term Energiewende, which is the German uh, name for the transition that needs to happen from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. Um, Wende being the term that was used when um, Germany was reunified in the 90s. And so, um, but the Energiewende is, is um, still being used today. And there, is, there are many kinds of Wende, there are many transitions that need to happen. Also the Agrarwende, the agricultural tr transition away from fossil fueled, highly pesticized, fertilized, corporate ag, factory farming, GMOs, etc., to uh, sustainable organic re regenerative farming. And, and that's what I'm going to focus on, the Verkehrswende or Mobilitätswende, that is the transition of the transport system away from individual fossil fuels to a public and renewable powered, safe and expansive pedestrian and biking infrastructure and more. So this is what it looks like on the island. The weather is <laughs> usually not that great, as you can see. Um, and there are actual horse-drawn carriages and lots of people are on bicycles or on foot. Um, and this is the downtown area. So, you know, clearly when you don't have cars, there's a lot more space for bikes and, um, and pedestrians and you don't have to worry about kids can bike there, old people can bike there, anyone can bike there. Um, we did have, or we do have these funny cars that are, we call them e -karre. They are fully electric um, and they are used for, sometimes they pull uh, carriages instead of the horses, um, but they're also used, for example, this is the, the postal service. Um, so these are, you've seen them maybe at airports or um, stations, but they are, on the island, they are the main, you know, 
many carbo cargo <laughs> providers. Um, but the, clearly, the idea has to be we want to live in an area, in a world that is safe, that is enjoyable, that is healthy, and where we can um, thrive. And so another place where that is done very successfully is in Freiburg in the south of Germany, um, where they had this um, quarter called Cartier Robin, and they made it so that it's basically car free. There are cars, actually. It's not entirely car-free, but there's a lot of parts that, that have been um, changed so that um, it's pedestrian only or bicy bicycles only, and, of course, it's very um, quiet. That's actually the one thing you notice when you go there. It's so quiet. You hear the birds. You hear the kids play. You know, you smell the, the flowers. You don't smell gas. So it's it's really quite wonderful. Um, another thing that, that was done very successfully last year is the 9 euro ticket, which was an attempt to make um, public transit attractive to people, and it really worked. So for 9 euros, for a whole month, you could go anywhere in Germany, just not on the fast trains, but on all the red regional and local trains, and everybody did. So the trains were packed um, sometimes so much so that you had to wait for the next one, but there was always a next one, so that wasn't a problem. And um, and many people who had never gone on a train trip before uh, tried it out. And you also noticed how many people actually couldn't otherwise because it was too expensive. And so this now they just on May first. Uh, so that was a, a um, three month experiment last year. Um, and there was a lot of um, enthusiasm about it, and many people said, please make it permanent. But it costs a lot of money, so the government now issued a 49 euro ticket, which has the same um, bandwidth, so you can travel with, for 49 euros paid once, you can travel the whole country all month, uh, the whole month, and you can, and it renews every month, so you can use it all year long. And, um, you know, so this is an attempt to get people to em embrace public transit and also make it um, make it affordable for people so that more people <coughs> can be mobile. Um, and of course, that then you know should help investments in uh, the electrified public transit infrastructure, um, <coughs> which exists. In um, this is in Switzerland, and I always joke about this because um, you know I I just took uh, Amtrak from Boston to New York and then Philadelphia and then Washington, Cleveland, and back to Boston. You never know where you are. You can't hear the announcement over the intercom. You don't. You you just hope that you'll get off at the right place. Um, there's no such thing as a screen with information about the upcoming stops, right? And, um, yeah, but, to be fair, Amtrak was punctual. <laughs> the German trains at the moment are not. <laughs> um, but this is, you know, um, very much the regional train. So the distance from Boston to here, this is the kind of train you would have that stops, you know, at every 10 minutes or so, and everyone can get can use it and, and can use that, that um, monthly ticket also. Um, and the, the screens don't only announce <coughs> where you are and where you're going to be, but also which connections you can find at the next stop and how you can you know, continue your travel. Um, another thing that I find particularly helpful is when you go uh, any city in Europe, uh, uh, definitely in Germany, but also in several other uh, countries, you have the information as to when the next bus comes and how long it's going to take and where they go and so on. So, you know, if you, I don't know if you've been to <laughs> the Amtrak station or the commuter rail station here, um, but you're, you're lucky if it says that a train will be coming <laughs> or something like that. Um, but usually there isn't much information. Um, and then, of course, you can um, go first class on the speed trains and enjoy yourself even more. But, um, and, and this is 
So we have, you know, it is utterly possible we have these kinds of systems uh, in many countries in the world and there's no reason for us in America to be so terribly behind on this. Um, and the same is true, of course, for bicycle infrastructure. <coughs> that is a question of making space for bicycles and reducing the space for cars and also making it safe for cyclists by reminding cars that cyclists exist. Um, and then, you know, the more you do that, the more people also embrace it, like in Copenhagen, where over 60% of people do not use a car on, on a daily basis. Um, and you need to have parking stations for bicycles then near the <laughs> big trans transit places. Um, and then you have room <laughs> to, for example, make a park <laughs> because you don't need that much room for cars. Bicycles are much smaller. But I also read <laughs> that Americans don't really like seeing these pictures. <laughs> Stop obsessing over Dutch and Danish bike lanes. Idealizing European infrastructure won't make North American cities any less dependent on cars. So that was interesting for me to read and makes sense. And of course, as someone who has now lived in the um, United States for 30 years and uh, here in Massachusetts for 25, I am painfully aware that we have a lot of work to do on this front. Um, and it may not be as, as easy as, as, um, as it looks in, in Europe. So I then asked the question, well, why is it that it's so different? Um, and so this article is really interesting where it talks about how Amsterdam beca became the bicycle capital of the world. Um, and, oh, I'm mixing things up here. <laughs> um, and that actually leads me to the next stop. So in addition to people power, we really also need creative uh, innovation and intelligence that is um, combined with um, with creativity. So, for example, in the Netherlands, and I'm going to show you about four minutes of this video because it's really interesting to see what happened there. Let's see if it works. Thank you. 
Okay. So um, I think that debunks the myth that the, the Dutch have always been better than us. And it shows us that we can, we can do this too. Okay, I think I should stay here. One second. Um, so the message is really quite clear. <laughs> Sorry. No. <laughs> I didn't want to go back there. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. So the message from this video is really quite clear, right? It is thanks to fierce activism and a number of decisive events that this changed. Activism and civil disobedience were rampant, right? That's what people did. They literally, I mean, I remember the, the Sundays without cars. That, that was really fun to be able to walk around not having to fear any cars would come. Um, and I wasn't in the Netherlands, it was the same in Germany. Um, but what you can see here is really creative direct action in order to make, to reclaim the space outside. And I think that's very um, encouraging. They were also really noisy <laughs> um, and with megaphones. And, um, and one thing they did was they painted bicycle lanes into the streets where there weren't any um, in order to make their point. Um, and so now you have these bicycle highways and bicycle infrastructure everywhere in the Netherlands, and it's really fun um, to bike there. And there's a lot of bike parking. I don't know how anyone ever finds their bike again. That's a whole other question. Um, and so uh, another example uh, for this kind of people-powered movement is, um, this is in Berlin, um, they, they do this um, once a year where they blockade the Autobahn and they get all the bicycles out and they get out on, um, on the freeway. And, you, and thousands of people participate and they, they do it like a star. So it's called Sternfahrt. So they come, they start at different points in the city and then they all converge on the center and then start cycling in the center. Um, and I was able to participate in this, and I have to tell you, it was the most amazing bicycle experience I ever had. Um, because here's me and my brother um, at the end, and this dude seemed to be in the picture. I have no idea who he is. But um, I, I tried to film it, so this is just a short um, few seconds from the bicycle. I think it conveys this sense of freedom that we had being on the freeway. And I have to say, it also made me realize that we prioritize cars in so many ways. Uh, it doesn't want to do what I want to do. Here's another one, short. Because I'm literally riding the bicycle as I'm filming. And they allowed us to go quite far. And I have to tell you, this experience made me realize, you know, that is the perfect surface for biking. And we never get that, right? For the cars, they spend an enormous amount of money making sure that the cars go smoothly. And when you bike, we, you usually get crappy surfaces and, and they're not kept in good shape. So. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to show you this because it's, it's a creative way of asserting we are here and we take the space back and it's fun and it reminds everyone that you're not alone. There's thousands of people that want the same and that spurs action and, and gets people to, to then, you know, demand further action. Um, here's another example that I love um, in um, initially in Bogota, uh, there was a, a mayor, Antanas Mokus, on the left here in the green car, um, who was initially a <laughs> university professor, and he became mayor, and, and he decided to um, interfere with uh, 
traffic problem by training police to become clowns. And the clowns then did things in order to prevent people from breaking the law on the street in the streets and making people feel, feel safe and it worked and so it actually was replicated then in Venezuela um, where they also used mimes to help um, you know deal with with traffic problems and I, I think that these examples just show you people can do crazy things if they just put their mind to it and you don't really need that much money or anything you just have to come up with a good idea and then you can change things. So how do we translate that to Metro West? <laughs> well, I certainly have a number of ideas that we what we could do. Um, but I wanna also urge us to think about the problem because um, I read that last year, the US News and World Report ranked Massachusetts transportation system 39th out of the 50 states and 47th when it comes to commute times. While the pandemic has reduced travel for some, traffic has generally returned to unacceptable pre-COVID levels. And of course, uh, like many of these issues, um, those hardest hit by these aging transportation systems are black, indigenous, and other people of color, as well as people with lower incomes. Um, we have an enormous rise in pedestrian deaths um, in traffic in America, that is um, the only country where these are actually exponentially rising. Everywhere else they are going down. Um, and it is mostly pedest pedestrian, as you can see here, uh, more so than other traffic deaths. Um, yes. No, I think this one is pedestrian only. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is only pedestrian, but I may be wrong. So I'll have to check it. Um, but but the numbers are embarrassingly high. And, and uh, so if you think back to the Dutch um, motivation, right, for, for protesting and, and starting all these civil disobedience actions, that was the reason. And so I think we have the perfect reason to do the same. Um, there's also um, a piece here it was in the New York Times that showed that there is a huge racial gap between these um, I, uh, when, when you look at these deaths. So the people in poorer communities, um, people of color um, in communities where redlining happened, where no investments have been made for a long time, are much more likely to get killed in, in car accidents. Than, than people in wealthier communities. Um, and interestingly, what helps especially is simply taking space away from cars. So yes, you need to educate drivers, you need to educate people, but the in th making space for people to safely walk is really incredibly important. And um, and that's something I think we can all agree on, we could see a lot more of. I was actually taking a picture as I was driving here <laughs> because I had thought about biking over here, but I was scared because I knew that between my house and this library, there are several stretches where there is no room next to the cars for bicycles, right? And so um, I think what we, in terms of our to-do list in Metro West, walkways, bike lanes, bike safety, obviously driver's license must include bike safety, but also making livable um, areas in our, in our uh, neighborhoods that um, are attractive for people to stay instead of making them all parking lots. Um, and then yes, making sure that the um, MBTA gets electrified, that we have more buses, especially here, um, in this area and um, and also more trains and yes um, also of course EV uh, charging stations and so on. Um, so one concept that I really like is called the 20 minute neighborhood um, which is all about living locally giving people the ability to meet most of their everyday needs within a 20 minute walk cycle or local public transport trip from their home. 
Um, and that includes all these features. And when I look at what um, you know, your sustainability committee people are doing, that's very much already in line with, with this concept. So I think um, we could all use that as sort of a, a guide where we need to go, right? In terms of the vision that we have, walkability, green streets, community gardens. Um, here we are, lifelong learning opportunities <laughs> right here. Um, but also making sure that people can reach um, shopping and healthcare facilities and schools safely from the home. It is, of course, the people who have an income of lower than $20,000 a year that are most reliant on these public transit um, options, and they are devastatingly bad. So, um, you know, we cannot go back in history, obviously. We're not going to use um, horse carriages unless... Um, something happens to our energy system. And yes, we should definitely also embrace um, the uh, electric vehicles um, as an option, but we all know that they come with some problematic um, aspects, right? In terms of the battery, lithium battery uh, supply and um, other rare minerals. Nevertheless, you know, they are kind of cool um, and I'm, I'm definitely hooked. In Europe, there is a commitment to only have emission-free passenger cars registered um, from the year 2035. Um, and so there is an expectation that I found in a, a study that um, it will probably be around 90% by 2035, and that will be a lot higher than anywhere else. Um, but there, even in Europe, things are not going according to plan. And for example, Germany is missing its targets with respect to uh, traffic um, by quite a lot. And you know, I always highlight the island that I came from without the cars. But the truth is, several other islands next to ours have cars, and they always have had cars. And I'm like, why don't you get rid of your cars? Like that is like the most logical thing to do. And or not. Um, so I think we do have public transit, but when you try to use it, you quickly find out that it is once every hour, right, or two. And, and this is for tonight. I just copied it to see what's the option. And yes, you can get, sometimes you have to flag the train, um, <coughs> you can get uh, to Boston, but um, you, you're really limited as to your options. And as someone who forgets things at home, and if I start driving and then I realize I forgot my wallet and I have to go back, well, then I missed the train. I have to wait to the next one. That might make it impossible because the show has started or whatever I'm going to. Um, it's also, especially for women, problematic. If you have to stand somewhere for an hour in the dark to wait for a train, Right? That doesn't feel safe. And I have to say, when I was in Europe last year, I didn't have to drive a single day all year, and I never felt unsafe because so many people were using the public transit system everywhere. I was never alone, even late at night. And so it's just a question of prioritizing this and putting the, the resources into it. Um, there is also then, of course, the extra mile, right? We don't always have, we don't live next to the, to the station. And so there's a really nice um, new development where they, where they create these um, taxi um, services that you can call and they collect people. Um, and I know we have something similar here. We have the Metro West Transit Authority, which doesn't have enough routes at all, but it is a start, right? And it needs to be, uh, it needs to grow. Um, and there are also um, services, especially for elderly people to use and for people with disabilities, and uh, in some cases, students. So, you know, it exists already. It's not like we have to invent the wheel. It's there. We just have to expand it and support it and make sure that more of it becomes available, you know, so that there isn't just like there aren't just three trains or three buses on on Saturdays <laughs> in one direction and 
that just doesn't make any sense. I also thought about the fact that Logan Express Bus, you know, Logan Express Bus is a fabulous invention. Everybody uses it. In fact, the Framingham route has over 580,000 annual riders. But who benefits? Not exactly the poorest, right? It's, it's people who fly. People who fly tend to be among the wealthier people. And so I think, but, th but it shows you that once people find it, they use it. If you build it, people will use it. And so if we can have the Framingham Express bus to Logan, why can't we have a Framingham Express bus to Riverside and to, to downtown Boston? Like that should not be that difficult. And we just need to get the five people to organize it. Um, it is a justice issue, right? Rich Americans have higher carbon footprints than other wealthy people. And um, in North America, the top 10% of people by income produce nearly 73 tons of carbon dioxide per person annually. Um, they are responsible for nearly half of all CO2 while the bottom 50% produced just 12%. And of course, worldwide, it, it is multiplied. So <coughs> while per capita emissions have decreased for poorer people in rich countries, they have increased substantially among the world's richest 1%. And um, it is therefore hard to see how we can accelerate efforts to tackle climate change without more redi redistribution of income and wealth. And that brings me to my last point, which is a campaign that we are now engaging in, talk about the 1%, because there is a terrible plan afoot in our neighborhood, namely at the Hanscom Airfield, to expand the private jet um, airport there. And so um, the development would mean 500,000 square feet of hangar space, um, which means 81 large private jets. It would triple the private jet capacity there. It would impact s many environmental justice communities around that area. And it would plaster 36 acres of land and clear cut mature trees, which is ridiculous at a time of climate emergency. Um, and just to see what that means, so a two and a half hour flight of an average private jet emits 24 tons. Remember, 24 tons. And so per year, all the operations lead to 898,000 tons. Okay, and then if this thing actually gets built, then we're talking 1.3 million tons per year. Compare that to a regular car, five tons per year. We're talking 24 tons per trip for the private jets, right? And we can build as much solar as we want, but that's not going to make a dent if we expand private jet tra traffic in our, in our neighborhood. So your house may emit 25 tons per year. A private jet uses that much for one, two and a half hour flight, basically. And so this is an injustice that just needs to be stopped. And so um, I'm, well, I'm hoping everyone will sign the petition. And we also really need bodies. We really need people to get involved uh, in this fight because we need to stop it. Um, and I hope um, everyone will participate. We have a wonderful group of people in 350 Mass who are doing this work. We need you. We need your friends. We need your neighbors. We need all of you. You can sign the petition by just scanning the, the QR code. There's also a, a paper version on the table back there. And um, I want to also mention that there, the EPA is now awarding money for um, clean school buses. So every community should be applying for that. Um, the deadline is August 22nd. Um, on May 8th, there is a transportation, environmental, and health justice hearing at the State House um, that has to do with the Fairmount commuter rail electrification. So, people, if you can, should uh, go there. There's also a way to um, email uh, uh, comments. And um, 
I think Framingham should apply that the Framingham mayor uh, joins the Institute on Pedestrian Safety. That's a really cool initiative from the mayor's innovation project. And, um, you know, we should definitely work on pedestrian safety. Um, <coughs> but I heard that the, the Metro West um, Transit Authority actually just went back to charging. <laughs> they were free throughout the pandemic and now they, on May 1st, they just started charging again. And so I think that is definitely something um, we should move in the other direction. We should try to make buses free um, because it just makes it um, more punctual and better for everyone. And I was really pleased to see that Senator Markey and uh, Representative Presley have reintroduced the Fair Free Transit Legislation Freedom to Move Act, also co-sponsored by Elizabeth Warren. And we should tell everyone um, in our delegation that we want that, that we want to support that. Um, there's cool stuff also. There's like cargo ships that run by sails again. Um, and this is an actual new company that does a sail cargo that does <laughs> that uh, works on, um, you know, carbon free shipping. Um, and another initiative that I really liked is an initiative called Climate Perks, where a company basically gives uh, its employees more vacation time so they can use slower tra uh, transport options and don't have to fly if they want to go somewhere so that they can take the trains, for example. So these are just uh, ideas for how to make this fun and, and exciting. Art is also a, always a good idea, right? Let's put art into our pedestrian zones and make sh slow things down. We need to decelerate and uh, artwork is always a good idea to do that. Color helps <coughs> make ugly places look beautiful. And um, yes, if anyone wants to do more research, here are some really good resources. Um, and that's it for today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so. so would you be available to take some questions? Sure. And if you don't mind just repeating or summarizing the question so that the folks at home can hear from the audience from you. Sounds good. Yes. Yes, good idea. Will do. It's also in the back as a paper version if you don't like QR codes. Yeah. Is never too late. <laughs> um, no, it's not too late, and uh, we're mobilizing with a whole bunch of organizations in Concord, Lincoln, Bedford, Lexington, and around, um, and we need everyone to stop this. Because what we found as we started researching it is that this is actually a worldwide phenomenon, a national phenomenon. Private jet travel is through the roof. People are more and more people are using private jets because they can afford it. And so these, um, and that means that these private jets need to be somewhere, right? So they are built and they need to be parked somewhere. It's basically like parking lots for private jets is, is what's happening everywhere. And this is like the worst thing one could possibly do in a climate emergency, yeah. Um, the, it's, it's complicated because Massport is actually partly involved, so it's actually the government, which is why we're targeting the governor with our, yes, 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 in fact, we are sponsoring all that private jet travel because they don't pay taxes. They only pay like a tiny little percentage on fuel, and otherwise, our taxes, if we fly commercial, you're actually subsidizing private jets in a big way. 
and they don't get to they don't have to pay um, the taxes that we have to pay if we fly commercial it's it's kind of crazy <laughs> and they got money during covid because you know emergency money they needed to be helped these poor billionaires exactly yes it's huge it's a lot of acres a lot of mature trees are going to be cut. For what? For people who take private jets to go to Aruba or something, right? They're not even used for, for work. Most of these are actually used for, public, for private pleasure trips. And so it is just a playground for, for billionaires, basically. And we're all subsidizing it. It is absurd. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, so for people online, I guess I should repeat. The question is, are there three audience? Audi could we just use a microphone or no? Okay. Okay. <laughs> because Larry has an answer, I think. Um, I know there are ordinances. I'm the chair of Framingham Sustainability Committee, and one of the things we're studying right now is tree ordinances. So if you have free time on the second or the fourth Wednesday of the month, you should join the sustainability committee and pub and per citizen citizens participation and raise the issue so that it gains more weight yeah yeah and i mean i hope the message that i was trying to convey has come through that if you bring five of your neighbors and you make a stink about it something will will happen right mhm mm Mm -hmm. Other okay, that sounds very technical. Um, I don't know if we. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think the committee seems to be working on that. So that's a good place to start. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so I'm originally from Oregon, and at least the Portland downtown area has a halfway decent metro system. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to England. Um, so, you know, just all over Europe, as you've kind of highlighted, halfway decent metro systems over there. And then I moved to Arkansas. Um, and so there was quite some culture shock there because they don't even have sidewalks, much less any form of reasonable public transit. Um, and of course, massive inequalities when it comes to, you know, neighborhoods and access to those kinds of resources. So when I moved here, I thought, huh, you know, public transit, it exists, mm -hmm. which was uh, a perspective, obviously, a leap above where I was. So it kind of surprises me that it's that low on the list, which leads me to my question. If we, according to your article, shouldn't be comparing the United States to Europe, where are some comparable US states or cities that we can model good public transit after? Well, I actually also um, spent a year at Portland, Oregon. And Portland is one of the places that has done a really good job, also in terms of cycling infrastructure. Like you can bike everywhere and it's safe and there's a lot of space for bicycles. And so Portland is one of the places that has done it right. Um, and I think 
of course, you know, when you bring this up with people, they will say, well, yeah, Portland has very different weather than we do. Right. I'm sorry, but Portland, if anybody's been there, you have to own rain pants because you are going to get soaked every time you step out the door. So there may not be ice, but there is inclement weather for sure. Right. No, there's definitely a lot of rain, but it's usually warm enough. So it's not, you know, I mean, there's not a foot of snow, but, you know, climate change will take care of that. We won't be having that much snow. So I think, um, no, I think, I mean, it's, it's something that we really need to prioritize. Right, and it hasn't been, and I'm really struck by the fact that there's a parallel because in Germany it's the same thing. The car industry is enormously powerful and has prevented the kinds of policies that should have been in place, like a tempo limit. Right, we still can drive as fast as we like on a freeway in Germany today on the autobahn, and that is absurd. And it makes no sense. And it would have helped so much to save energy. And so, you know, but the, but the car lobby is incredibly powerful to pr prevent that. And we have, at, at the moment, the coalition government that includes the business-friendly liberals that are not going to, you know, restrict the liberty of drivers. Um, but I think, and, and so in that sense, we're actually ahead here because we have sensible limits, um, speed limits. But I think the biggest thing, uh, what I was thinking when I, when I saw the, the film about the Dutch was what we need is we need some really creative direct action to get bike lanes, right? So that there is space for bikes that is safe. Ideally with a barrier in between so that you don't have to drive next to these giant trucks that can't see you. Um, because it's also a safety issue, of course. Um, and that hasn't really happened enough yet. And so maybe the pain is not quite where it needs to be, but in terms of the dysfunction of the, the MTA, I think the pain is, is way up there. So I, I think we are ready. Um, and the fair share amendment, of course, was partly meant to address some of these concerns and is supposed to address some of these concerns. Um, but I think we also really have to get active locally much more and louder. Um, and since it is a justice issue also, I think we need to really work t on building alliances in that regard. And one of the things that struck me um, when I m moved here or out of Oregon was the small ways that the, the cycling culture has been integrated, especially mm -hmm. Um, with driving, one of the things they test you on when you're taking your driver's test is, do you check your right mirror when exactly. you turn right? Is there a bike there? Mm -hmm. um, and when you are signaling to change lanes or whatever, are you checking your mirrors for bikes? Are you crossing right. appropriately through the bike lane? So it's sort of integrated into, in the tiniest of ways, mm -hmm. car culture, yeah. such that bike culture is equivalent in some ways. Yeah, so I was interested to see that on the on the government website they said that still driver education does not have the same impact as simply enlarging pedestrian walkways and and making giving cars less space right i mean studies have shown and that's also what something we need to always r drum into people's heads studies have shown that more lanes of street mean more traffic Right, this notion that somehow if you widen the streets, you make traffic go faster, that is just not true. In fact, you reduce the traffic, you reduce the lanes, you force people to think creatively into, okay, how can I do car sharing? How can I use public transit? And put the money there. How much, I mean, cars stand around 90% of the time, right? So car sharing and in terms of the future mobility, we will have much more, um, you know, sharing like the Uber and Lyft type where people can s simply hop in and hop out for a certain, um, um, you know, length of time. Um, and it's also going to mean you will need, need far fewer parking lots and parking garages and streets and you can actually put housing and parks and playgrounds and the kinds of things that you want 
in a in a healthy environment. No, and of course, um, these ideas for mobility for the future are all ways to get away from what you call the me culture, right? For the individual um, liberties and, and to actually embrace a more collective identity. And I think that will also address many other concerns. I mean, loneliness is a huge concern in our societies today, right? Um, especially among young people. And if you are forced <laughs> to actually, you know, go out there and move on a bicycle or go on a train where you hopefully are not constantly staring on your phone, but <laughs> actually engage with other people. I mean, the being together is so important. And yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, it, if we do it right, it can solve multiple problems. Um, but I think what what is needed is a really smart movement that I that prioritizes this. And so we've got our work cut out for ourselves. <laughs> I don't know how much longer you want me to go. Okay. So I don't know if there were questions online. I don't. Okay. Okay. We lost people. Well. Was thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much to Dr. Von Meering for sharing her uh, education and wisdom and uh, hope with us for the future tonight. Um, thank you for being here, as I said, for the final lecture of this particular series. We hope that you will join us in the fall as we pick back up with our series. Keep your eye on our website and our newsletter for more updates once we finalize what that series will look like. And if you want a uh, uh, immediate update, do sign up for our newsletter. That will also let you see any other events that we have going on. We have been recently thrilled to partner with the Framingham Sustainability Committee on a sustainability series that has just ended, but we are in talks to continue that series. So keep your eyes open for that as well if you're interested in this particular topic. Um, I believe Dr. Von Meering has brought some of her books here tonight. So for those of you who are in the room, um, stop by the back table. She's got some books available for sale and uh, perhaps signing. I don't. Are you doing signing as well as the only translate? <laughs> um, and then also uh, the petitions. If you are interested in joining uh, 350, or uh, if you're interested in signing the petition for the jet airfield, those are on the back table as well. So thank you again for being here both tonight and in person, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.